And I want to draw here on some work undertaken by Terry Maguire and uh, a colleague in Ireland, John O'Donoghue, um, reconceptualising numeracy. Um, and what they did was map concepts of numeracy which they found in various parts of the world and in various uh, formulations of adult numeracy practice. And they arranged these along a continuum um, through increased levels of sophistication, starting with formative, going through to mathematical, and the sort of climax of integrative. Formative phase is where numeracy is considered as basic arithmetic skills, the sort of limited proficiency model I mentioned earlier. The mathematical phrase, phase rather, um, is where numeracy is seen as mathematics in context and it entails an explicit recognition of the importance of mathematics in daily life. The integrative phase, which I say is the more sophisticated of, of the three, is where numeracy is viewed as, and I quote them here, a complex, multifaceted, sophisticated construct incorporating the mathematics, cultural, social, emotional and personal aspects of each individual in a particular context. So very broad, but the whole point is integrative, bringing those things together. I, what I want to do here is um, propose a way of combining that idea of a continuum of sophistication with a way of thinking about adult numeracy, which I um, wrote about a few years ago, where I looked at it in terms of what I call domains one and domains two. This is following on from work by Kathy Kell, who's at Auckland University of Technology, as it happens. Um, she looked at literacy, and I, I thought that's a very interesting way of thinking about numeracy as well. Um, so adult numeracy in domain one has high use value and it's, uh, sorry, low use value, and its exchange value is very high. And this, I would argue, is what um, could be seen to characterize the uh, sort of infrastructure of skills for life, for example, the numeracy curriculum in, in that and the testing that goes along with it. So looking at questions why, what, and how, well, why? Why would one involve, engage in that? To gain access to institutions of modernity, based on the belief that to be numerate is beneficial both to the individual and to society. And very importantly, and bearing in mind I'm talking about England where there was, and still is to a certain extent, a very strong target culture, professionally in, in the field, for accountability to funders, to managers, and so on. So what is it? Well, um, it was sort of materialized through a formalized, standardized, certificated curriculum, positioned as basic skills, what, what Clive Keynes calls visible numeracy. The content can be abstract or divorced from context, although context may be simulated, but often that's in very highly stylized ways, which the people actually working in that context may not recognize as having anything to do with that context. Um, how, through teaching and learning materials, which may be technologized, unitized, or commodified, and tools, including information communication technology, may be used. And the written form is, is privileged, and that written form may be on computer, but it's uh, nevertheless is privileged over the practice itself. In domain two, adult numeracy is a very different kettle of fish altogether. Use value is high, but exchange value is low. So why would one engage in that? To do something, to understand something, to become proficient in something. What is it? Well, it materializes through informal, non-standard practices, which may be regarded or, in fact, disregarded in, in research I've done on this. Often people would say, oh, it's just common sense. Just common sense. All concerned may say that, not just the person actually doing it, whatever it is, but um, everyone around as well may think, no, it's not math, it's just common sense. And in the research literature, there's quite a lot of uh, work being uh, done on this, and the term invisible mathematics is often used. Uh, Keynes talks about usable numeracy in, in this way. So how is this um, learned, I suppose one might say? Uh, through social activity, or it could be alone in your head, 
Um, tools may be used, depending on what's involved, what it is, including ICT tools. Um, orality is the norm. In other words, the spoken um, rather than the written form is privileged. Who is involved? Well, in domain one, um, the deficit model of the learner prevails, so the learners are deemed to be deficient in mathematics in one way or another. The teachers are positioned as professional experts. Um, now, this has been a very interesting uh, development within Skills for Life, of course, because under Skills for Life, there was professional development for tutors in a much more systematic way, geared to the curriculum and the tests uh, than existed before. Not that there was no professional development before, there was, but it was patchy, it was, uh, you know, I'm now talking about a much more systematic infrastructure which uh, came through with Skills for Life in England. Um, but of course, being a professional expert in something which is contested in terms of what it actually is, you um, see, is, is a tricky situation to be in. Um, and the field of professional practice itself is poorly defined. Um, in uh, Domain 1, traditionally, there have been non-professionals and volunteers involved in um, the teaching. Well, of course, that becomes problematic as soon as you say everyone must reach this standard in order to be able to teach. So. When would it happen? Again, in, in uh, Domain 1, there would be an emphasis on set times, it, of, you know, coming to a class, for example, or meeting as a group at a set time. Except, of course, in open distance learning, where uh, there is flexibility on, on that sort of level. And where would it be? Well, it would tend to be in set locations, in some kind of institution, or maybe an adjunct to a, a workplace or whatever. Again, except in open distance learning. In domain two, where, if I just remind you, use value is high and exchange value is low, who are the learners? Well, everyone, all of us. Um, the, you know, it, it's everyone involved in processing enculturation into whatever it is they're trying to do, what has been called communities of practice. And the teachers may not be formally teachers at all, but they may be more experienced people, someone who knows the ropes, someone who knows how to do whatever it is the person is, is learning how to do. When would it happen? Well, at any time. It could be incidental to other activities. And where, well, anywhere, depends what, what it is, in context, in real life, everyday life, the workplace, whatever. So a very stark distinction there I'm drawing between domain one and domain two, and I hope it resonates with perhaps uh, the experience of some of you. As I say, I tried to map that idea onto the uh, degrees of sophistication which uh, Terry McGuire and John O'Donoghue have identified. And this is my attempt to do so, really, to look at these two on two different axes, to think, well, you could have um, a sort of very formative view of numeracy in domain one. But you think, I haven't really got time to go into this in great detail, but anyway, I, I put this to you as a sort of way of thinking about it you might like to explore amongst yourselves, perhaps, uh, at, at the conference if there's time. So, I'm arguing that, as I say, numeracy operates in two discursive domains, um, as I've just explained. Um, the integrative definitions of numeracy, which Tony McGuire and John Donoghue talk about, um, have influenced recent pedagogical frameworks and standards, and I think that's, that's very exciting. I don't want to be giving you a sort of pessimistic message here. I think there is a lot of uh, good stuff going on and a lot of hope for the future. Constructivist views of learning have been influential. That's something I would also applaud. Um, in other words, a recognition that learners actively construct knowledge. and They do so by integrating new information and experiences into what they've previously come to understand. And against that background, a very broad range of research is relevant. I would argue that use value and exchange value are both necessary in a knowledge society. 
maybe it's not good enough any longer just to be able to do something. Maybe you do need the certificate that says you can do it, but that certificate has to have some relationship with the thing it is you're supposed, it's supposed to be certificated, it's supposed to be validated. Um, in knowledge society, I think this is really important. However, there's repeated calls from employers in the UK at least uh, saying that they are dissatisfied with the basic numeracy of school leavers and of employees more generally. Um, many firms see a grade C or above in mathematics and English at the school leaving examination, which is called the GCSE, as a benchmark of employability. But in 2007, for example, barely half um, of school leavers hit that standard in, in mathematics. I would say that we need to see numeracy in terms of both social practices and skills. We need domain one and domain two, in other words. And we need to see them in the sophisticated way that um, is termed intuitive in the framework I've been in. So what about the adults? Um, well, I just want to take a moment just to um, say something about some research I did uh, quite a few years ago with a colleague, uh, Janine Thumpston, our, our research on adults' mathematics life histories, because I found what has really resonated for me uh, through the years. We interviewed adults about their relationship with mathematics throughout their lives. We weren't only asking them about their school mathematics, we were interested in their adult engagement with mathematics, um, whatever they wanted to tell talk to us about, really. And these Four points are really our attempt to try and characterize the main things which came up again and again with a very large percentage of our, the, the people we talked to. People we talked to were anyone who would talk to us, really. We, we weren't being choosy. We just said we want to talk to adults about you know, the place of mathematics in their lives. And we thought nobody would come, but they did. And <laughs> And we thought nobody would talk for very long and we couldn't stop them. And we thought everybody would be sort of riddled with maths anxiety. And that wasn't the case at all. Um, some were. Um, and that was even more impressive that they still came to talk about it. Uh, many, as they began to talk, got really, most people became very engaged and really quite excited about what they were saying. And people often said, I've never talked to anybody about this before. This is fantastic. So these, these four points which came up again and again um, were what we call the brick wall. That was the point at which mathematics stopped making sense for people. And of course, not everyone hit the brick wall, but for those who did, um, it could have quite an impact on them and their lives. And they would describe, somebody would say, for example, I was fine until I got to long division. Or, it was okay, and then you know we did this thing of dividing a fraction by a fraction, and that lost me, and I never had a clue what was going on after that. And it was like hitting this brick wall affected all the learning which might have come after that. It was sort of impeded by this bruising experience of hitting the brick wall. Many, many people talked about someone who had made a big difference in their relationship to maths and the way they thought about maths, positively and negatively, depending on you know, people had very different experiences one way or the other. But we tried to sort of characterize this as, we called it the significant other, someone who was a major influence, as I say, positively or negatively. Sadly, there were some very negative examples of uh, people who felt they'd been ridiculed or you know, belittled. And, uh, it really did seem that for some, um, you know, some, some of these significant others were really using mathematics as a form of abuse. It was, it was some really sad stories. Anyway. People also talked about the door, which uh, some people actually talked about it being the door mark mathematics or the gate or whatever, and whether it was locked or unlocked, and, but you had to go through it if you wanted to get into a particular job or form of training or get on in your line of work or, or to go on to further study. And the final thing was, I uh, mentioned earlier, this idea of invisible maths. Um, the mathematics someone can do, which, which they may not think of as mathematics at all, and they just dismiss as just common sense. And that, again, was a very common thing that a lot of people said, oh, well, I can do that, but that's not that. That's just common sense. And then um, it's almost like mathematics became a sort of moving target. You could never 
be good at it because what you could do became common sense and wasn't maths anymore. So that was interesting, I thought. So from this, I want to sort of draw to a close here and look at some professional and practical issues which can be and some no doubt are being addressed in New Zealand and elsewhere. So how do we find out what, a, what adults can actually do? How they use and understand the habits, how they actually function as numerate people, how it features or how it might feature more productively in their lives. And as educationalists, how to organise provision, how to teach, learn and assess for adult numeracy, how to recruit, prepare and professionally develop adult numeracy teachers and managers. And I would say here, don't forget the managers because managers can have a big impact on what actually happens um, in, you know, in teaching and in, in the organisation and, and design of provision. And how to design population surveys which really do measure what, what we need to know. And who are the teachers, the learners, and crucially the non-participants, the people who are not coming, who perhaps are showing up in surveys as being potentially needing help, or actually needing help. So I would propose some practical solutions here. Rigorous, humane, use-inspired basic research, I'll explain that term in just a moment, linked to sustainable development of the field, and I think we have a lot to learn from each other. I'm speaking to you from the 18th International Conference of Adults Learning Mathematics, which brings together people from around the world. Um, and we learn so much from each other in terms of comparisons and from being able to establish collaborations. So, use inspired basic research. By that, I mean it, it's an idea taken from Stokes in 1997. He talks about research in Pasteur's quadrant um, and the uh, graphic which goes with this shows um, a sort of two-dimensional grid with research being inspired by one of two things, considerations of use or the quest for fundamental understanding and the answer yes or no to each of those questions. Um, and the Quest for basic, for, for, for fundamental understanding, for example, um, would be, Pasteur's work would come in as use-inspired basic research because you'd be able to answer yes to considerations of use and yes to quest for fundamental understanding. Whereas, for example, for Niels Bohr's work, extremely important work, quest for, for fundamental understanding would be answered yes, but considerations of use are not a primary focus of that research. So what I'm arguing is that use inspired basic research, um, and in this instance I'm talking about adult numeracy, is particularly important um, thing to be thinking about and to, to be working towards. So what would that look like? Well, um, it would have a broad focus on numeracy or mathematics in a range of different settings. It would engage with the diversity of adults there rich and varied mathematics life histories, their purposes for learning. It would address issues of social exclusion. It would have a very broad focus on numeracy content. It would be the opposite of the reductive limited proficiency model. It would have an integrated approach to numeracy education, um, you know, both discrete education and that integrated with other subjects, for example, learning a trade. It would aim to maximise progression for learners, staff development for practitioners, and the production and dissemination of new knowledge and deeper understanding for all. Teacher researchers, or I should say perhaps practitioner researchers, would be fully integrated into research teams as we tried to do and did do successfully um, on several uh, NRDC projects which I was involved in and also projects in Scotland which were and very successful on that front. And where possible would be, uh, or would have some kind of international perspective. I think it's much easier these days, I'm speaking to you from Dublin, 
um, and I hope that's working well. Um, it's possible to communicate in these days in ways which was not possible even sort of 10, 20 years ago, anything like as easily. And some of the uh, ways of doing that, um, clearly the conference I'm at at the moment, and I just want to give a plug here for the fact that next year the ALN 19 conference will be hosted by the National Centre, so it will be in New Zealand, so I hope to see all of you there. Um, but not only LM, there's also in the USA, there was the Adult Numeracy Initiative, um, EMMA, which was the European Motivational Mathematics for Adults Network. Um, in Australia, a lot of um, work on adult numeracy sort of crested in the 1990s, to use a surfing image there, which I, I wrote about myself in 2006, and I might like to follow that up. Um, so, just looking specifically at teaching, um, these are some points about how to, how to teach effectively and how to um, build on what research has to teach us about uh, numeracy teaching. This is from Malcolm Swan's uh, work, supplemented by um, work at, work at uh, King's by two former colleagues of mine. Um, Malcolm said, such, work should, such teaching should build on the knowledge that students bring, so it should make a reality of what was an aspiration specified in the adult numeracy curriculum in Skills for Life, but as I'm saying, I feel this largely didn't materialise, sadly. Build on the knowledge students bring, in other words, engage with the students' context, find ways of doing that. Exposes and discusses common misconceptions. Develops effective questioning. Uses cooperative small group work. Emphasises methods as well as answers. Uses rich collaborative tasks. Creates connections between mathematical topics uses technology in appropriate ways. And I would add there something which is implied throughout Malcolm's work, but perhaps um, I think should be specified uh, here, uses formative as well as summative assessment, because there is very strong evidence that formative assessment improves learning. Now here, what looks like a blank screen up here, is a dynamic uh, graphic trying to bring together elements which I think um, form a way of thinking about some positive approaches in, in teaching. Again, I haven't got time to go into them in a lot of detail, but I've given the references at the end for those who would like to follow them up. PUFM stands for Profound Understanding of Fundamental Mathematics, allied, I would say, by positive attitudes towards the learning of, of uh, mathematics, towards becoming numerate, or more numerate. Connectionist teaching relates to work done at King's College London, where I've um, been working to recently, uh, by Mike Askew and, and colleagues, um, who identified that as a factor in strong teachers in their study, which uh, was undertaken uh, a few years ago. Deep progress um, is a very interesting concept in terms of not just superficial uh, improvement, but what one should be looking for as a teacher is deep progress by students. I would say also as a professional one means deep progress and not uh, just a superficial uh, sort of fitting on the surface as well. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that should be allied with a very critical concept of numeracy. Again, I haven't got time to go through um, all of this in detail, but some um, research recommendations from New Zealand by John Benson and colleagues, which was published in 2005, um, arguing for a large-scale survey um, of teachers which would give a basis for expanding uh, professional development programs, for example. Um, an authentic curriculum, and I think authenticity is a really important concept to have here, but it's, it's not easy to achieve, but that's not to say it isn't very, very well worth striving for. They say it would be very useful to identify to what extent Authentic curriculum is being incorporated into teaching across the variety of contexts of literacy, numeracy, and language provision in New Zealand, and analyse issues around its use and so on. And they also want learner focused longitudinal research in order to have a better idea of the learners, including the case study approach to give some in depth understanding. 
So, I'd like to draw to a close by saying it seems to me what we need is sustainable research for positive development in this area. Let's make the most of the opportunities for research to get results and to make a positive difference for New Zealanders. I would argue that needs to be used and inspired basic research along the terms of discussed. And I'm going to end with a question to you. What will you do if you agree that that's a worthwhile aim to make this happen? Because it will only happen if it means something to you in your workplaces, in your relationships with colleagues and with learners. So thank you very much. I hope that uh, was of interest. There are references which you can follow up um, in the, uh, the PowerPoint display. And I want to, in my final words, to be big, big thank you to colleagues and friends of LMA team, especially warm thanks to Jonah Hagen, Terry Maguire, and Barbara McGarrelli. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, and goodbye. <laughs>